They're coming to get you, Barbara. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master Mark Warman. Joined by his out of this world cousin Dougie. Oh, hi, Mark. His apprentice and daughter, Alyssa. Whoa, whoa, stop. And his childhood best friend, Royal. Mark hates everybody. His protege painter, Will Scott. You got one job. This is Graveyard Car. So today we're gonna to install the exhaust system on the 1969 Daytona. Royal actually stopped by, which is always great, you know, being able to work with him. Awesome. It was right. so nice to work with such clean, clean <laughs> stuff. Oh yeah, you know, he doesn't get super sidetracked like, you know, some people, so it's pretty great. All right, so um, you wanna get one side, I'll get the other. You gotta kinda of maneuver it in between the okay. torsion bars and... One of the things I love about the new systems that we're using the ECS is their attention to detail. You see that it has all the right crush zones in it, all the right saddle markings from being in the, the mandrel bender as it gets formed and shaped. It's made of the original material. The mufflers are date-coated mufflers with the vendor coat on them. Same thing for the tailpipes. The higher the dollar of the car and the more accurate that you want it, like a Daytona Charger, this is the perfect system for it. Ah, there you go. One, one way to skin a Mopar. Take it apart, put it together. Yep. Take it apart, put it together. Now here's the deal. They do a phenomenal job. Cars don't come back. Those are all good things. But watching them work, it, it should be entertaining, right? I mean, it's a TV show, it's a TV show. Okay, you want me to grab this? You, you see me out there, I'm doing all kinds of stuff. This is like the, the variety show, I'm spinning plates, I got a dog dancing in a tutu. I'm trying to entertain you. These guys, it's just morbidly boring. Yep. Oops. It's like watching paint dry. It just takes forever. Do something. Kick him in the ass, make fun of him, insult his bald head, do something. Here we go. All righty. I'll hold that. I got mine. You got yours? I got one. Okay. When you're dealing with a car where they made 503 in the beginning and there's only a few left in the planet, and you're an OEM restoration shop, attention to detail is of the utmost importance. That's why we use that system. How I found out that they were making a great system was we were at SEMA a couple of years ago, and the owner of the company, the owner of ECS, Dave Walden, he built a concept four-door uh, Barracuda, 1970. One of the most phenomenal jobs I've ever seen as far as craftsmanship and attention to detail. If Plymouth built a 70 Barracuda four-door, I can't help but believe it would look like this. He had mirrors underneath it, and you could see the exhaust system. He had to custom build an exhaust system, but follow a complete OEM principle from the very exhaust manifold all the way to the back of the exhaust tips, and he did absolutely incredible detail and quality. And so that's why we're going with those systems nowadays. Today, we are getting ready to do our second prime on our 1971 Demon. Pretty cool car. We don't do a lot of A-bodies here. And I believe it goes red. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm 99% sure. But it's the first Demon we've ever done. I was excited when it first got sent out because frankly, when it comes to the Mopar muscle cars, first off, the A-bodies are kind of our unsung hero as a lot of people know, and we haven't done very many of them. We don't get a lot of A-bodies through here, so when you do get an A-body, it's really cool because there's so many people at home that love them, and we always get people that ride in, you know, hey, do more A-bodies. So this is one of those cars that people are absolutely gonna love to see go through the shop. It's a really rare car when it just started life. With 2051 four-speed 34071 Demons made, that puts it down there in a pretty low demographic. Another thing to make note of, the Dodge Demon was only made at the Hamtramck plant. These cars got three prominent style lines that go down the side. 
So it's real important that you maintain the crispness, the sharpness, the straightness through the whole process. Do the second primer, really look the car over, because once this thing's painted, it's gonna show just any wobble in the line, anything at all. The body guys did a great job on it, so we're looking at probably two coats of our nice, thick, high build primer. Let that sit before we bring the car back in and then do our final block and get it ready for paint. Now, this car was registered in the official Mr. Norm's registry in 2000, I think it was. And back then, there were only 51. I'm sure there's more now, but there were only 51, and it was number 16. So what happened was the manufacturer built the car, then it went to Mr. Norm's, he bought the car, resold it, and he made these modifications to it. Some of the modifications were he put a six-pack intake manifold on it. Now, from the factory, as most of you know, the only multiple carburetor small block Mopars that ever left the factory were the TA and the AAR. That was a 1970 model and it had the three two barrel Hollies. Mr. Norm took the original four barrel intake manifold off and put a six pack intake manifold. And get this, General Motors Corvette carburetors, because they were cheaper than the Mopar carburetors back in the day. A mechanical secondary linkage instead of the vacuum like it is from the factory, so it was much more responsive. And they topped that off with uh, this cool aftermarket Siegel air cleaner, which ironically says tri-power on it, and that is not a Mopar term for three two-barrel carburetors. Ford used it and GM used it. Mopar never used it until they came out on the Dodge Demon. Okay, that, <laughs> you editor, you producer, what is with the slow-mo on Will? Is that something he's paying you guys to do because he's supposed to look cooler like when Tom Cruise comes through the fog in Top Gun or a Days of Thunder and the smoke kind of dissipates real cool. He's not cool like that. This ain't the Chappelle show where everything's a lot cooler in slow motion. If you want to do slow motion, do something with me and I'll show you how you can make it look a lot cooler. I honestly have not seen another muscle car come through here with the documentation this car has. And when it's sold at Mr. Norm's and you have the original window sticker from Dodge, the original window sticker from Mr. Norm's, the broadcast sheet, the key tag, the key tag numbers, every piece of documentation that that car had, right down to how much money they put down on it when they bought it, is in the file. That makes this a thoroughbred 1971 Demon 340 Mr. Norm six pack four speed car. All right, want to move on to the mufflers? Yep, we'll tighten those up after we put the mufflers on, yeah. right? All right. I think I still remember. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> Hook the front, and then we can just set it right in the back over here. Ow! <laughs> you want these? Ow! There we go. Oh, gotta watch your hand, man. The doctor's going to yell at you. Uh, he said just don't screw up his work. <laughs> Mark says that to me a lot. Don't mess up his work? Yeah. As Royal and I are putting in the exhaust in the car, Mark actually walks in, and I just think, oh, here we go. More drama. I am looking for the cue ball. Cue I'm ball. Looking for my number one bowling ball, chromium downside. Rolo's back. <laughs> Rolo is Thanks, back. Buddy. You know, he points out the exhaust, and you know, he, he thought it looked great and beautiful. God, that's a nice system. Uh, and then he started with the story saying, Royal ratted him out to the police. Um, I was just telling Dougie about the time you ratted me out to the cops. <laughs> what? Yeah. Ratted you? I never ratted you out, buddy. That, sir, is absurd. What I is just he... said it was some guy had a motorcycle on 14th Street. Doing what? And I'm like, oh, whoa. I didn't know if this was like some fabricated story that he came up with. Oh, we were, we were up riding, his, riding the Bull Taco, wasn't it? This is how it went down. It's about 1976. I've got a Bull Taco 125 Persang. That was 
14 years old, I wasn't old enough to drive legally on the street, so I'd hop the alleys all the way down to 5th Street, and then 5th down to the Old Mill, and then up the hill I'd ride. Well, Botaco 125 Pursing is about the loudest bike on the planet. So you don't get the luxury of doing that. I wanted to go riding with Royal. I said, meet me at the top of South 4th Street. Yeah, I think we were 15. We were up there riding the Bull Taco. If you primed it one little dot too much, just one little push too much, it would flood the engine out. So I says to Royal, I'm going to coast start it. You get coasting down South Fork, which is a steep hill, so you got plenty of momentum. You come down on that seat, at the same time you pop that clutch. It's like popping a clutch in a car, right? Right before I make the final turnaround in the road to come back up, I see a cop. I see the cop, I make a split decision. Up the hill. Cops started coming up the road, so he goes, uh, Royal, don't say anything. I'll be back. I'll meet up with you later. After about an hour, I decide it's got to be safe to come back. So I says, man, what, what the heat want, man? What the fuzz want? So I started walking down the hill, and cop stopped me and says, hey, what, what's your buddy? I said, I said, he's not my buddy. Oh. I don't know. I mean, he just had a motorcycle for sale. All I did is tell him that he lived on 14th Street somewhere. You, no, that was the reason I ran. Yeah, how do you pick a guy out of three, three mile long stretch of road? He didn't tell my last name, of course. Although you can't miss his. <laughs> First name and last name, what else you tell him? Your phone number? Yeah. So the cop just took my name, that was it, left. Did you happen to get a chance to uh, give my address? Yeah, he wanted to know where it was, 640 North 14th Street. <laughs> Did they ever show up on your front door? Yes, they, they called my house. No, they didn't. My mother got a phone call from the Springfield Police Department reciting that I ran from them. I didn't give him anybody's you phone number. Fake. You gave me my phone number. You gave me my social security number. How would I get his first social security number? As you were, gentlemen. As, as you remember it. Yeah, as I remember it is based in fact <laughs> and history. Turns out it was, there's some truth to it, but you know, you can never really get the true story. I'll have to talk to Royal later. I never ratted him out to the cops. Okay, well you enjoy yourselves. Have fun putting that system on. You're doing a great job. You rat He ran from the police. I talked to him. I had to stand there and make up a story on the fly. I'm not as full of crap as Mark is. I can't think that fast. I'm gonna have to side with Royal on this one. Uh, he seems uh, like a pretty reliable guy. <laughs> uh. Oh, this is going really quick. Oh, yeah. I, I love these systems. There's such awkwardness and dead silence whenever Royal's involved in something, or Dougie, or Justin, or well, anybody but me. My Grammy Prince all over it. <laughs> like I said before, the mama jokes, you know, come up with a few of those. If you don't have those, do some knock knock jokes. Hey, Jamie Gummy, or knock knock. You're Clarice, don't you know that? You're knocking on my door. She comes in, she sees a butterfly, and starts popping off caps at people. Next thing you know, Jimmy Gum dead in the basement. And what is the question again now? So Royal and I got the exhaust in the car. I can't get that right there. It went pretty smooth. We had a couple hiccups here and there. How come everything I do is difficult? <laughs> Yours goes right in. Here we go. You going? Yeah. Yeah, you're in there. You know, it's always nice having two people work on these H-pipe systems, just because you got to maneuver it in there. With this being done, I can actually move on to interior stuff, which I'm really excited about. I got the Phoenix Cuda brought over to me. Wasn't quite right, so I kicked it back to the mudroom, gave it to Austin just to do like the fine detail work, some stuff that he had missed. He still kind of knew, and you know, we're working through that together. Great guy, though. So while he's fine-tuning it, double-checking everything, at that point, we can start getting color going. So we take the doors off, hood, deck lid, fenders, all the parts and pieces off the car, get them into the booth, and get them all sprayed blue. And then all the parts and pieces will be ready to go back on the car in a couple days. So when it came to Wendell's car and the B5, I just mixed up B5, the same B5 that I've always mixed up, and actually did some of the jam work on it. Before I realized when Mark came to me and said, holy crap, in 1971, B5 is completely different. So the B5 blue in 1970 is different than the B5 blue in 1971. When they're side by side, it's actually quite a bit different. So the most common B5 blue is the 1970 version. 
while a 1971 B5 Blue is very similar, but it's definitely lighter. So it's kind of cool to have this run of V5s I've done for years all be one color and then find out that on Wendell's Cuda, it goes a B5, but it's a lighter version, which you would never know. And thank God Mark caught it early on. Otherwise, this car would have been painted darker, just like the rest of them. But I do prefer Wendell's color just because I haven't, haven't done it yet. So anytime you do a new color, it's exciting, it's fun, and it is a very, very nice blue. From the Graveyard Cars Season 5 Vault, this 1970 Cuda 340 automatic, loaded, one of only one cars was restored. It had a rear spoiler. What is the sales code for that rear spoiler? Is it J68, J54, J81? If you watch the episode or Graveyard Cars at all, you should know the answer. Stay tuned after the break and I'll let you know how you did. All right, folks, on our super rare, super loaded 1970 Cuda 340 automatic Tor Red. What is the sales code for that cool rear spoiler that does appear on the fender tag, by the way? If you guessed J81, you are right. Good job, you paid attention. Sales codes J68 are for the rear window louvers, backlight louvers, super, super rare option. J54 was the bulge hood that they called out on the LA cars. This car also featured a black hockey stick stripe, V6X. It was Tor Red EV2. It had bucket seats, C55, and a center console, C16. Not to mention it was a rally instrument cluster with the 8,000 RPM TAC, sales code A62. Occasionally, Mark uh, drags me out of the shop and uh, says, hey, Doug, we gotta go, I found another car, and uh, it's always fun to get out of the shop, go on a field trip, Mark and I, and the rollback, you know, and he always likes to distract me, taking his phone and filming me while I'm driving. Sometimes we pick up cars locally, just half hour from here, or something like that, and uh, other times we have to drive a couple hours or more to go find a car. One of our uh, field trips was down to Oakland, Oregon, and uh, a guy named Brian, and uh, we pull up here, and oh my gosh, there are cars all over this guy's hillside, back in the trees and whatnot, and uh, what an adventure this was, meeting this guy. It used to be I would cruise around all the back roads when I was growing up and looking for old Mopars. That's how I found my 70 Charger. But these days, with the internet, those days are gone. So for me to be able to get out of the shop, uh, go down and see my friend, and check out the rest of his cars, I think it's just a fun day. Testing, testing. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Brian Renfro. I'm selling a 1969 Charger RT 444 speed track pack car to Mark today. So I've been trying to buy this little 69 Charger RT from the first time I saw it. A friend of mine down in Oakland, Oregon, had that car. He's got a bunch of cars, but this was the one I really have been hounding him to sell me. I did buy the car from a friend uh, a number of years ago and did a bunch of work to it, drove it for a little while, had a good time with it, and then one thing led to another and I had to basically park everything. So it's been sitting for a number of years. So one thing about Brian is he's got quite a few acres in a very hard to find area. You got the tag in the house, right? Yes, sir, yeah. I do. I got a picture of it. All right. These cars, all of them, you would never see them from the highway, period. They're hidden. And there are still places around the country like that. There just aren't a lot of them left in Oregon. Pretty solid, pretty clean. Doesn't look like it was ever stuffed. Rails look nice. Where'd this car come out of, Brian? If I recall, it came from Sweet Home originally. Oh. So I suspect okay. that the original engine probably ended up at the Albany swap meet. So this little Charger is a real life XS29L car. That means that it's an RT and that it's a 440 Magnum. It's a D21, which is the call out for the four speed. But you got the numbers transmission, has a busted ear on the mm -hmm. yeah, thing. It's yeah, over okay. here. Okay. The one thing I did manage to save. <laughs> <laughs> sort That's of. That's great. <laughs> yeah. 
That happens. It's actually a pretty well optioned little car. Now, it's, it doesn't have everything a guy might want in one, but it does have the more important things in it. So like the N85, the factory tachometer. Is this a factory N85 car? I can't remember. I don't uh, I think so. Is it a TAC car? Oh, good. It is a TAC car, yes. Is it an AM FM? No. Somebody added an AM FM radio to the car. It's a factory AM FM, but it's not the one that started life in that car. The car is coded for an R11, which is an AM only radio. So I'll put one of those back in it and I'll have that in inventory for somebody who does have that option. Where's the shifter? I have sold him a few challengers. I sold him a police car at one point, a 1970 Fury 440 police car. If I recall, it belonged to Lane County Sheriff's Department. I like, like that. It. Headliner's decent. It has the L31 turn signal indicators. It is a bucket seat car. That's really cool. Hey, Mark, there's the shifter. I had, I had well, to there's make it fit. Well, this that doesn't look very factory to me. No, it's not. Oh. Which is why I had to make it fit. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I like it, though. Oh, that yeah. looks familiar. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, it was never quite in the right spot because you would bust your knuckles on the dash yep. when you shifted it hard. Yep. Oh, yeah. That's the way they were. <laughs> Pistol grips were even worse. Uh-huh. Get all your knuckles, Hand huh? it to this guy in the back, and he would shift it into third gear for you. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is an A33 car, so it uses the 354 Dana behind a four-speed. You either got the A33 or the A34 behind a 444 speed in that year of car anyway. Got a little bit of rust right here. Depends how it is when it comes out of the dipper. You know, sometimes you can just put a small piece in right here. Sometimes you got to put the quarter on. The AMD quarters are good if you put them on all the way up and you pre-fit everything like you're supposed to. Rear body panel has a little crusty crusties in it. That's okay. These factory welds up here, Mark? Yeah, I think so. There's two things on that car that are disappointing to me. The original engine's gone. It's not the end of the world, but it does affect the end value of these cars. The other thing is it's not coded for a stripe. It's actually stripe delete. So that means it didn't get the cool bumblebee stripe that it could have got. Instead, it has the badges that call out RT on each quarter panel. I don't know if you remember Dan Perkins or not, yeah. but I, I got this from him. Oh, yeah. yeah. I bought that 70 Charger from him. Yeah. That burnt orange black top car. Yeah. yeah. Well, we got some more Mopars to look at, I guess. Sure. All right. So with every build that you do, if you're an assembly technician, the funnest part is once that body and paint's done, is putting all the trim and ornamentation on it because it really starts to come to life, begins to look like a car. So the Daytona has really unique ornamentation, such as the fender scoops. So these fender scoops have studs screwed into them, molded into them. And when they set down, they go through the uh, holes that are already made by the factory. These are the original fenders and then you put the captive washer style nuts on the back. You have to be really careful installing these. And to be clear, when these fit the way they do, it's because we pre-fit them. They didn't fit that good from the factory. You would bolt them down and there would be a gap underneath them. In this case, we had the scoop on the fender and took time to sand it completely to match the shape of the top of the fender. Now when we put those nuts on, it'll suck down into position exactly where it's supposed to go. Okay. That's that one. Oh, that one. Cleaning those threads really works good. Since these are painted off the car, I took the time and I cleaned the threads up. If not, it really gums up the nut that you're trying to, you know, tighten those things down with. And then you could potentially stripping it out or busting it off. Cool. Let's go take a look at this glorious collection. 72 Challenger? 72 Challenger Rally. Rally, 340, mm -hmm. automatic numbers matching? Um, at least for the most the part, engine. yes, the engine is. This is cool, it's an original FY1 top banana yellow, black top, black interior, 340, numbers matching except for the transmission on it, but not necessarily at the top of my pecking order. Uh, but for somebody out there that was looking for a 72 Challenger Rally, I think this would make a really good one for them. 
A lot of it is just stuff that I've tripped over over time. I've come across it and, and it was at a reasonable price, so I picked it up. Some of it is stuff like the Yellow Challenger. I got that from a, an old wrecking yard in Cottage Grove. It was sitting way out in the back, buried in the brush. And so we, I pulled it out of the brush, myself and a friend of mine, we loaded it on his trailer and it ended up getting a bunch of body work done to it. Uh, Boy, if I, like I recall, it had a manual shift valve body, which I had to fix a little bit so it wouldn't do that anymore. I threw a different transmission in it and drove it for a number of years. And, and like everything else, I had to park it. <laughs> Take a look under the hood there. Here we go. Got it. Got it. Beautiful. Nice. Boy, that looks pretty darn original. You drove this car for years. I did. I saw it all over Springfield when I was younger. Wow. When we were younger. It, need, it needed some different shocks on the front of it, but this thing handled pretty darn good. The Challenger, is, as far as driving, was, was actually my favorite car. It handled really well, considering the size of it. It did real good. The Charger was fun. If you wanted to point it in a straight line and spin the tires, it was good for that. <laughs> <laughs> Which one would be the favorite that would be the Challenger? I drove that a lot of miles, and uh, it was really comfortable. I've known Brian for uh, probably 20 or 25 years. He used to work at a shop out here in Springfield. That's where I first met him. Always been a Mopar guy. This is actually where I've showed you the hood that came off of a 70 Challenger, a flat hood that was purple and slight damage in the front. That was the one I got from Brian that he got from Butch when, when Butch passed away. He oh my on, gosh. Butch held on to the hood from 1978 when I helped him put the hood on the car. Everybody knows that I bought my Dodge Charger from Butch Peterson. I was 16 years old and he needed help. And I, I loved hanging out with him and hanging out on cars. So I was kind of his little helper. And one of the first things that I did was to install a used K-member in a 1970 Dodge Challenger 318. Also, the hood was stuffed on it. And at the time he had found, this was a plum crazy car, he found a perfect flat FC7 hood that we could just bolt on there and not have to do any paint work to. Well, when I went up to Brian's right after my friend Butch passed away, and I was talking to Brian, he said that he bought out a lot of stuff that was at Butch's house. <laughs> right there in this pile of rubbish was the hood I unbolted off the 1970 Challenger when I was 16 years old. The first official hood I ever took off of a car. So I asked him if I could have it for old time's sake and he let me have it. So I still have that hood out back. The car that jumped out at me is the 71 Fury. Four door, white, 318. And I have bought some cars from him over the years. I bought a, a 70 Fury police car. It was a real PK car. Is it a PK car? Or? No, oh, no it's a 318 car. It's not a police car issue, which with the first two letters of the vehicle identification number would be PK. Oddly enough, PK is the police edition, so. You know, it's always fun for me to be able to take somebody uh, like Brian, who's got a heart of gold, everybody loves Brian, and then throw him in front of a camera because they don't really want to be in front of the camera. They're doing me a solid. Yes, yeah. oddly right. enough, the police car that I sold you, Yeah. This came into the tow yard a friend of mine worked at two months later. With the Scots, <laughs> was it? It's funny because we all have ticks, right? Me, I can't stop bragging. That's a, I guess that's a tick. Dougie, he dummies up and just starts repeating himself over and over again. I have a lot of nervous ticks. <laughs> I don't know that dummying up is all of them. <laughs> Brian's a nervous laugher. I love you, Brian, but <laughs> mm, it's just some nervous laughing, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this would be a good car to build into a tribute car. It's solid, it's all original, it's in good shape, it has everything on it that it started life with, so to convert that to look like a squad car would not be that difficult. Our 71 Hemi Cuda is one of the rarest cars that we've got here right now, and the most desirable. When you're talking about the car everybody wants, it's a 71 Cuda, and probably the engine is the 426 Hemi. Um, it's getting to be really exciting times because I'm getting ready to start doing color on Wendell's 1971 Phoenix Cuda. 
it's a great client, and when you're doing these cars, for someone as appreciative as he is, it makes it even that much more exciting. This was his baby, keep that in mind. It's 20 years ago that this car caught on fire. And the fact the car blew up, and then here we are, getting ready to start putting color on it already. So it's exciting for me to see that it's in the process of getting its jam work done, because once that's done, we can bolt the sheet metal back on it, line everything up, do a final block, and get it painted. Now the process really will speed up. Hopefully, as soon as he is done with it, we can move quickly to get its suspension underneath it so we can have the headliner put in it, bring it back over here, and do the final assembly. So now that the parts and pieces are all done, I can kick them out of the booth, actually bring the body of the car in, and then at that point, I have to jam the engine compartment. I have to jam inside the cab, the door jams inside the trunk. Even though it's a jam, especially the trunk and the engine compartment, they need to look like the outside of the car because you, they are high camera areas. People pop that hood, the inside's gotta look just as good as the outside. Now we don't cut and buff those jams, so that's even more pressure to make sure everything comes out clean, Take your time, maybe lay it down a little bit slicker than what you would on the outside of a car. You have to jam a car this way. There's no way to go back and jam a car when the parts are on it. So from factory, these cars got dipped. It went to this big vat of a rust-proofing material, but it only went halfway up, and then they didn't do anything on the top. So that means the top of the car would eventually rust out. Here at Graveyard Cars, completely different. So there is so much detail paintwork that we have to do that you guys don't see at home and every square inch of this car has paint on it. And then the longevity of that car is forever, as opposed to with factory, it's not. And now that we got the parts and pieces all wrapped up, we can move to the more exciting thing of getting the body done. Once that body's done, we can start putting the car together and getting the final paint done on this 1971 Cuda. Since the Daytona actually has the add-on with the nose cone, it doesn't have the latch. Uh, it's got no vertical support for the latch. So the only thing that keeps this hood down is the hood pins. So they actually have to be down enough to keep the hood in line with the fenders and the nose cone to keep it down. So it's a little bit more of a process actually putting these on, lining them up, making sure they look really good because they gotta keep it down. I say actually a lot, don't I? I really have to be careful while mounting these. Uh, if the screwdriver slips or you gotta redrill those holes, if something slips and scrapes the top of that hood, it's gotta go back for body work and repaint. You gotta be careful that you also don't over tighten the screws or else you're gonna see wrinkles in the tops of the hood as well. One thing to make note of on the Daytona is the side markers that you see are not actual side markers, they're reflectors. And we have to paint them the same color as the stripe. So if this car had a white stripe on the back of it, like Tom Partridge's car, we'd have to paint those housings white. In this case, we painted them black. So I just got done installing the side marker lights and everything turned out really nice. You got gophers? <laughs> I got moles. I don't think I'd call them gophers. <laughs> oh, <that's okay. laughs> I don't live in the country, I live in the city. So I don't know the difference between a gopher and a mole. In all practicality, they're probably the same creature. I don't know why there would be two different ones. Well, one's bigger, right? A gopher's a lot bigger than a mole. Oh, wow, 60, this is your 67. Yes. Barracuda 383 automatic, one of 98, how many? One of 749 made. Oh, wow. Yes. I got that one wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. 748, but who's counting? <laughs> Don't try to. That's okay. We make those mistakes. I'm using, I'm using under the hood for storage, but. Well, sure. It's I mean, got, it's got a, I have this original motor. It's over there in the pile. This is out of a 68. You right do have now. the numbers engine for it? Yes, sir, I do. The 1967 Barracuda Formula S, I think that is a great car for somebody. There are real diehard lovers out there that love these little A bodies. And that's a real live big block car. And he's got the original numbers matching engine, probably like the four speed we found for the charger buried mud, but at least it's there. Is that the correct manifold? Yes. Boy, that'd be a good one to put together. This is a fastback model car and it's pretty clean. It's showing some signs of rust underneath the recent paint job that it had starting to pop up. But again, a very good restoration project for somebody and well worth the investment. 
Well, and I made the mistake of ordering the copper penny carpeting for it. Oh. And it actually is supposed to have bronze carpeting in it ah. with the copper penny seat covers. Gotcha. Two-tone interior. Two-tone interior. Very pretty. So if I do it right, it'll actually look pretty good. Oh, it'll look real got nice, that yeah. <laughs> it's got the 383 four-barrel with the Formula S emblem. You actually texted me at the right time. Yeah. Back in season five, we restored this beautiful, one of only one, Tor Red 1970 Cuda. True or false, this car was a four-speed manual transmission. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. I'll come back and let you know how you did. Now, you should be paying attention. If you watch those episodes, you should know the answer. You actually called a, or texted me at the right time. Yeah. Um, that wagon that's sitting up front is the 69 Ambassador wagon that my parents bought brand new. No way. Yeah. That's cool because that was his parents' car and he bought that at Grant AMC. The one that my parents own is the wagon. It's a 1969 AMC Ambassador wagon. There's not very many left as far as I can tell. And they bought that brand new at Grant AMC in Eugene. So when I hear the names like Grant AMC, it just Boy, it takes me back to the 70s right now. I am working to restore that and get it so that I can at least drive it again. I believe it has all of 116,000 miles on it. It's a clean old car. So anybody out there in TV land that likes those AMC Ambassador wagons, that might be a good one for you. <laughs> 344 <laughs> Speed Tour Red, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So some of the cars that I think are still worthy of salvaging, one is a car I've known about for many, many years. It's a 1970 Duster. The one thing that I do know is a friend of mine, he said that the, he had the original motor for it. Yeah. It had an accident, it had a crack down the middle of it. Oh. Yeah. Once so, you into that motor. It was garbage. The factory 340 four-speed car. Now this car belonged to a couple of brothers when I first started my shop in 1985. It's had lots of modifications to it. The original engine isn't in it anymore. It also was harpooned in the side and had a bunch of mud work done to the left quarter. Still a good, valuable car for an A-body lover. All right, folks, how did we do on that one? Our 1970 Cuda, one of only one with all of the options this one had, 340 Tor Red. Was it a four-speed manual transmission or an automatic? If you guessed false, you are absolutely correct. This car was an automatic transmission, 340 automatic. But just a few things to add to that that it had from the factory on the fender tag. A62 Rally Instrument Cluster, G36 Color Key Dual Outside Racing Mirrors, V1X Black Vinyl Top, J68 Rear Window Louvers, J81 Rear Spoiler, and V6X Hockey Stick. That's a loaded car. So today I'm getting ready to put in the sound dampener in Tony's 1970 Challenger. It's gonna look great. One thing that I just would like to get uh, cleared up because we oftentimes take a little bit of heat in the social media Sometimes deservedly so, not always. And in this particular case, it's talking about Cindy D'Agostino 70 Challenger. This is the one that Tony bought for his wife that we're just finishing up the restoration on. You'll see us adding a sound deadener product to this. From the factory, it didn't have that, I agree. But when it comes to driving a car, which Tony has done his whole life, he's owned the best Mopars on the planet, still does. He knows what it's like to have a car that rattles or the heat that can boil up inside there. So putting a sound deadener in a car, as long as it's underneath things like seats and door panels and carpet and consoles, so you can't see it, then it's a winner for me. He's taken several liberties on this car. Originally, it had the V3X uh, bumper guard down the side of it, the rub strip that went down the side. That's not attractive, so he didn't want to keep that. It was a black top car. Uh, he put a white vinyl top on it, put a white longitudinal stripe on it, and went with a full white interior on it. But that's because it's Cindy's car. And I'll always say the same thing. 
Keep it original from the standpoint of things you can't change. Don't get that, rid of that engine. Don't get rid of that transmission. Don't cut numbers off that need to be there. But if tomorrow somebody bought the car, it wouldn't even cost very much, and you could put the car exactly back the way it was on the assembly line according to the fender tag. Now that I got the sound dampener in, I'm ready to install a carpet. This carpet is awesome because it comes flat, shipped in a box, not rolled up really tight, you know, left in a box for however many months. So I can pull that out of the box, just set it in the car, steam it out really quick, make my cuts, and it's done. And now that the carpet is installed, I can build out the rest of the interior. They're everywhere. Boy, they <laughs> are. Everywhere. Boy, they are. Yeah, they are. Is this a 70 or 71? I think 71. It's a 71. Yes, sir. Yeah. 440 non-HP. Non-HP. The other car that was really notable was this beautiful blue 1971 Chrysler four-door. There's the L31s, Doug. You like L31s, don't you? I do. The L31 is the only sales code that Dougie remembers because the 70 Barracuda Grand Coupe had them. So the code for fender blinker indicators is L31. That's a neat looking indicator. Uh-huh. You see how low profile that is? Yeah. So to this day, the only sales code he knows is L31. I had them on my car, so that's how I know what they are. Do you know any other code? No. <laughs> <laughs> it would be interesting. Look at the uh, look at the transmission hump inside. Flat? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's got your favorite little cassette player on it. Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> you buy the car just for that. I would. <laughs> <laughs> I love the seats. That's cool. Look at that. Yeah. Oh, it's a nice old car. This would make Alyssa a great driver. This would be an incredible driver for somebody who didn't have to have a muscle car, but wanted to cruise in the 70s in style. Got the cool interior. Dual armrest. That is so cool. I don't think I've seen an interior like that. No, I haven't either. No, you got to get into the Chrysler's to get this type of material. The interior on this car is amazing. It's actually in really good shape. It's a, it's a velour, it looks like, type of insert with a really unique pattern to it. It's blue like the outside of the car. It's loaded with really neat options. It's got power windows, telescoping and tilt steering wheel, which is a really cool option. Makes it very, very comfortable. And it's the R36 AM FM cassette player from the factory. Okay. A real freeway cruiser. That trailer hitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's oh, a vintage yeah. trailer Good one. hitch. That'll pull our trailer. <laughs> At the end of the day, it was a fantastic trip. I got to see some really cool cars, some I've seen before, some I haven't. The Charger that I sold him, when he contacted me, I went out and looked at the car and had decided it was it was time to send it to a good home. The amount of rust and various things in it were starting to get worse, and I knew that if I didn't get rid of it pretty quick and send it to a good home, then there wouldn't be anything left to fix. I know he'll do a good job fixing it up, and I told him, I said, when you get it done, I want to ride. <laughs> <laughs> We bought our 1969 Charger RT, 444 speed, B5 blue, and moved it down to the bottom of the hill. That's where our new tow truck was. Got it loaded up on there, said goodbye to Brian, and next thing you see is taillights.